Alrighty, so we don't have our numbers today, but really quickly inside of Facebook, we can always look inside of our insights, and I'm looking in here to see like what is the damage from George's decisions that he he made for Globe Shell, and so far they're minimal. Um, we're losing only about three people a day. There was this initial spike right after this purchase spike of about 30 people, and now we're just averaging about loss about three people per day. Twitter is actually a little bit slower to remove folks. Uh, we've only dropped down about 14 people from uh, where we were around, around 1,200 uh, on Twitter. It does. It takes a little bit longer to realize these uh, adjustments in um, fake Twitter followers. But again, remember the experiment is that we're going to see where we would have been had we or had we not bought Twitter followers. So we're going to do the projection and follow up. Um, I guess this will be next semester. But it's interesting that so far the lie will seemingly hold for at least another month. Uh, at this current rate, and we'll see if this is actually helping a social proof. Remember, social proof, one of these elements of digital influence. Today, we're going to go over mobile apps, whether or not to do them, uh, content marketing strategy, um, influence, and inside of influence, moving data to action. And let's jump into it. So, pop this open, everyone can hopefully see this. I will allow. All righty. Mobile web versus app. So first I want to start off with a question. Um, has it ever, have you ever been in a organizational role, either it's a nonprofit, for profit, wherever it may be, where someone said, let's build an app? No. <laughs> Great. So, so my question to you is, we're sitting in Globezell now, and the question is, should we build an app? We're a company, right, that's, whose job it is to push out Content and make sure people are watching. Don can't hear me. Don can't hear me. He's watching. Yeah, I, I am much more involved with that. You're just distracted. Really? So I'm on mute. Well, you're just seeing my face. Like much he can louder. barely hear you. Can you can you mute your webcam? I mean, I can, but this is technically receiving just fine. I can yeah. see my audio levels actually almost yeah. maxing out. It's not you. It's Donnie. It's not me. It's Donnie. <laughs> it's Donnie. <laughs> That's Donnie. So you can't do audio. Yeah. Fair enough, Don. I'm sorry. Read my lips. <laughs> I am sorry. <laughs> so okay. Alrighty. So where I'm going with this? Should we build an app? Yes or no? no. What do you guys think? No. Whoa. <laughs> Hold on. We have no Jiminy money. Cricket. <laughs> we got no money. Oh man. Um, Greg. Greg, I need numbers. <laughs> uh. All right, so should we build an app? Why'd you say no? Because nobody watches this channel and nobody cares about it. Uh. Oh, we're going to give it away for free, so I'll throw that out the window. All right, how many engagement are you going to get? Hmm? Ah, we get, a, we get a student somewhere. So let's say we're a company, and let's say we're a company that had whatever couple million dollars in the bank because we sell widgets and that's our thing. Should we build an app as Globesdell? If money, money should be an option. So your vote is no. No, too much. Should we build an app as Globesdell? Website has like a mobile version, which no, it does. But you know how websites you can stretch your website 
Yep. So that's that's mobile web. I will make sure that we're clear on that. So we, no, because we have. And then everything else that we do is in Yuki as its own language. That's not what I was saying. That's not true. Greg tells us like we literally get thousands in the thousands per week of people minutes watched. Oh. That's pretty cool, actually. I like to move the chat. Um, all right. Great. Should we build an app? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Eeyore. If you're gonna be a grumpy Gus. Nobody watches Grumpy anymore. <laughs> nope. Not okay. All right. Why else? Why should we? Build an app, yes or no? We have, we have, this is expensive, it's, you know, unique. You say yes. Why do you say yes? Well, it's money for us if they can build it. Not sure, we get a student to build it. Yeah, I mean, if you have a bunch of really heavy equipment, they can come in and just put some code in and see if that can work. It won't hurt. It won't actually hurt us. Like, we're talking about, like, the doctor's credo, do no evil. Sure, it won't do evil to us. Five percent. Okay, everyone else, should we build an app? Yes or no? What are the other considerations? Well, I'm going to try to confuse the hell out of you. This is my job because this is a discussion. As you don't know what you're going to do, you're going to be sitting in this meeting. I promise you. And please, when you're sitting in this meeting, call me, send me a text, send me a tweet, and be like, George, it's happening. Because it's going to happen. I guarantee it. As sure as you can't hear me, right, Donnie? Nope. Shit falls downhill. Um, Don't let this be recorded. This would be amazing if it was actually recorded and I just like just let it let no, loose I, on ex I have expletives. Like no levels. That's perfect. So, I mean, it's just <laughs> so this is just funny. You're just like recording? Sort of. Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> 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 I digress. <laughs> I feel like this is like a chaplain meets meets lecture moment. All righty, so we have this discussion. You're gonna have this discussion again and again and again. And actually, you guys are slightly outliers because I feel like there's the more push and pull. Some of the common things you'll hear on the on the yes side is like, "Are you kidding me? Do you know how many apps I have? We're trying to reach teenagers. We're trying to reach college age students. How many apps do you have? Do you all have smartphones? Raise your hand. Of course, everyone raises your hand. Everyone has a smartphone. I can actually see it. You'll probably actually be distracted by that smartphone during this very lecture. I I'm willing to bet that that will happen. So, oh my gosh, we have so much uh, potential real estate and attention and eyeballs that we could have if only we had an app. Uh, there's, there's no mic levels, so I'm just doing classic overreactions to very simple, basic things. It's funny. My mom says I'm funny. All righty. <laughs> Off we go. All right, so what I'm going to talk through, mobile web versus mobile app, I want to talk about a mobile landscape and go take you back to the future. Um, shout out to Michael J. Fox. All righty, so two... 2000, what we get? The web is awesome. 100% mobile traffic, uh, web traffic from computers. Um, we have this Symbian OS. This is the first like mobile phone PDA smartphone that comes out into the world. This is not that freaking long ago. This is coming out, blowing people's freaking minds. <coughs> the web is awesome. People are asking questions like, and they're having in this very meeting, should we build a website? And it, the obvious answer is yes, because the web is coming. Um, email is also awesome. People are opening at rates of like 40 to 50%. Email, it's the shit. It's like electronic mail. You send it and people open it. It's amazing. 2000. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Greg has been thrown in front of email. Something like that? Tell your friends to email my friends and we could be friends. Um, 
first BlackBerry, 2004. All right, now we're starting to get practical business application. We start to get real market share out there in the world, getting around this like 10% of market share of people being like, holy shit, this is super useful. Finally, I can be, you know, a CrackBerry addict. Love the sound of Linux. Right? Right? But where's my little wheel of death? Where's my wheel of death? <laughs> so, 2005, MySpace was awesome. Should we be on MySpace? We're asking questions like, should we be on YouTube? 2005, YouTube, right? The thing that we're uber dependent on just freaking came out in 2005. They're like, what is this crazy thing? People uploaded videos. And now over 72, um, 72 hours per minute are being uploaded. It's nuts. Windows. Um, at this point, this is the highest Windows will ever be with a 37% market share with their smartphone offering because they have this insight into business and the, and the world. Um, they make it up to 37%, but not for freaking long because it's alive. Um, the iPhone comes out and truly revolutionizes what it means to have a smartphone, redefines the touch screen, and signals the initial death of the, the BlackBerry and the sort of like typing action. And now we have got babies that think magazines are broken because of their swiping motion. They've trademarked the, the swiping thumb. And at this point, email, um, just a benchmark. Email is beginning to drop as we have uh, more clutter in the communication world. Email open rates. Remember what open rates are? What are open oh, rates? Um, <laughs> open rates are, um, it's just depending on if you open it or not or what the lead up is. Exactly. So do I open your freaking email or not? And basically the number is dropping slightly uh, over time here uh, as we realize where it was. And I'm just pointing out a macro trend where you can see something that is happening underneath everything going on. Google Android comes out um, about 2008 here, um, also as a benchmark. Facebook, 100 million users not that long ago. Should we have a fan page? You know, we're sitting in the meeting. Should we do this thing? Okay. So some other, no, no, yeah. Um, some other elements. So 2010, um, Twitter, 100 million users. They hit that. Should it be on Twitter? We have the web, 10% web traffic now from mobile devices. So this is in 2011. This is you know slowly gaining. 10% um, market share was like starting to get people's attention, with, uh, meaning like the mobile web, people accessing websites uh, via their phones because they have more and more smartphones. We're moving from very quickly. This is the fastest growing technology adoption in the history of humankind. We're talking like it beats the wheel, it beats the fire, it beats the horse, it beats the everything. 20%, 43% of penetration for within one year for penetration of this device across uh, usage in the US. Um, as we move forward, we get to uh, 2012 where we had 35 billion app downloads according to 2012, uh, according to Pew. And you know the question begins to arise like should we have an app? There's like billions of these things out here. We got to get an app out in the app store because that's the only possible way we can get into these phones. You, are, uh, you all are obviously much smarter than that because you're aware of the mobile web and the fact that if you have a website that is mobile web, you're able to jump in. So here we have 2013, 15% web traffic, and that's trending about 15 to 20% right now of total US mobile traffic. Um, but don't be fooled by averages. Um, and 56% uh, ownership of smartphone in the last, yeah, as of February, that number now is 60% penetration for smartphones with data plans, 80% total for, um, for phones. The data plan obviously allowing you to um, charge your parents for going on Facebook. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if your parents pay your bill. There we go. I'll be honest. No? I haven't paid my phone bill since I was 16. That's pretty Only good. Only time since I was 18. Yeah. Oh, I got cut off late in life. It hurt. <laughs> I was like 22, I think. <laughs> so where we're going, where we're going is more and more web traffic. I'm like guessing that in like the end of 2015, we're at 80% uh, web traffic or mobile by, uh, by mobile device, including tablet. Uh, when you add in tablet, we're closer to 30%. Uh, a number, like obviously tablets and all that wide range of devices is slightly different user behavior, but it is certainly increasing. So in here, whole bunch of numbers, all you really need to see is general trends where we have cell phone adoption and cell phones at 91% for just, do you have a freaking cell phone in the US? And this desktop number decreasing for new sales. 
And what's happening is there's this shift of tablet and easy to access devices and an increase of where we have mobile devices um, going up. Are there things in here? Plateauing for game consoles, yeah. I mean, the game console market, I mean, does, I mean, what do you think about the game console market? Why isn't this line shooting through the roof? Because, well, I'm sorry, it, you're talking about audience, right? It's, it's not new anymore because it used to be new, right? Like, you just get the iPhone and it's like, oh, this is like getting out there. Right? Competition, market share. I spend most of my day playing um, the Angry Birds, right? <laughs> the problem is we have increased. <laughs> I just like putting the in front to like age myself. It's pretty good. Um, uh, whatever, everyone knows Clash of Clans is where it's at now. <laughs> Not a movie. <laughs> so Pew, great question. Thank you for asking. Pew, 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 Pew Research Center is one of the most renowned um, organizations for doing research on US behavior and adoption of technology. They do a bunch of things. But if you're ever looking for like some of these benchmarks, John said something about how many people are using phones and I'm trying to write an intelligent paper or tweet or whatever it may be, uh, you can go to Pew Internet Research and look up whatever you're um, trying to find. Great for infographics if you're trying to put together like a cool fun thing to demonstrate your portfolio. All right, so should we have a mobile site starts to become the question now in um, 2013. Hopefully it should have been in 2012. But Glovesville and in its infinite wisdom now has a mobile, uh, mobile responsive site, meaning it's one code base that responds based on device. So let's talk about native mobile apps. What the heck does this actually mean? So here, here we go. Um, what is the difference between a uh, mobile app and mobile web? That's an open-ended question. I'm, I'm curious what our level of understanding of the difference is. I think the mobile app would be focused on the app store. And the mobile web would just be focused on the app store. You seem not sure. On the store, but not, but not mobile. OK. So you're right. So you can be more sure now. Nice job. Kudos. Brownie points. Uh, for example, that's an app. I've downloaded it. Of course, I could download um, technically and save like an app, a web page, but people don't do that. Um, this was purchased, download, found in the iTunes store, um, or if you're on Android, the Google Android Play Store. And this is the web. Access through here, mobile web browsing experience. Everyone clear on that? It's like a basic difference. Here's the market share. 90% um, of the market, Android is winning. So Apple is slowly losing this battle because Android is more of an open um, open platform. Yep. Yeah, it's also owned by Meta. Some of its products. They have tons of branding, yes. But App Apple's market share has been uh, dropping and losing to Android because Android is an operating system, not a singular device. iPhone is a singular device that its newest innovation is changing the goddamn color of its phone. So unless they come out with something very, very good in September, this number is going to continue to drop. So the thing is, when you have multiple device players on one operating system and just one for Apple, like they have got a great experience because they've tied the whole bundle together, right? Their software is proprietary. The iTunes store is proprietary. All of it runs in just their, their device. So they can make a pretty slick experience. But ultimately, over time, companies that do that lose. They end up with a smaller niche market, which is possible you won't lose, but you will never be the big player. Android is taking a long view saying, like, we are an operating system. And by the way, yes, we buy Motorola and get rid of it or have it. Uh, we've got the HTC. We've got Nokia. We've got all of these other people innovating, right? The difference between, like, an iPhone and, like, you can hold, bring out my, hold my phone up for folks. I would argue that this, this device right there looks nicer than an iPhone right now. It's thinner. It's got <laughs> higher capacity. Right? Um, and people can copy it yeah. and undersell you. <laughs> so, so, 
<laughs> cool. Uh, no, sure. Um, I'm just pointing out what the data say. And this what is like what's. Samsung? Because they're the only one that has it. So, what is their operating system? Yeah, so. What about Windows Phone? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I like it. I like not. I hope John. <laughs> John Ray is still watching, being like, what is happening today? Um, <laughs> with no audio. <laughs> There's the secret. Um, ah, gosh. Go back. Go, go back. Let me see if I can zoom in for us. Ah, close enough for government work. Alrighty, so um, some basic principles of mobile app versus mobile website. Um, if we're thinking about a pure mobile website, um, obviously we have to have an internet connection, either Wi-Fi, data plan. Um, we have it access through browsing. Um, we have some limited features. You know, it can be it can be fast. The the development costs are pretty reasonable, right? Because you have one code base. It supports every single device that we were just talking about. Um, inside of the app store, you know, we're not listed, so that's a detractor. You can't be listed, and people can't find you in the app store because people are still hungry to download new apps. Um, and there's no approval process. I don't have to wait in line um, to be dubbed worthy uh, by the iTunes Store or um, the the Google Play Store. On the pure mobile app experience, um, you can only access it after it's installed, of course. Um, it is going to be a bit faster. It is available offline, so you can have pre-downloaded things that you can zip through offline. You know, if you are playing Angry Birds, you notice you don't need an internet connection. Um, many apps, however, do require that, such as Google Maps or Gmail or Twitter. Those aren't super useful apps when you're not connected to the internet. Um, with regard to speed, it's going to be very fast because it's already got this content preloaded. Um, it's going to be uh, significantly more expensive to develop this app. It is available, obviously, in the iStore, uh, iTunes Store, and Play Store. And the approval process, look, sometimes you're going you're to get blocked. For example, um, let's say you wanted to build an app that donated to charity. Pretty innocuous, seems pretty nice. Google, uh, sorry, Apple will not allow that. You cannot technically have an app that you can click to download to a charity on Apple. So the reason for that is, um, I, can, I can be a jerk about it, but like they want to control all of the payment processing that happens through their platform. They want to, to determine what happens there, and they don't want to allow that type of transaction through their platform, even if it is for charity. By the way, Apple happens to be the least charitable company out there among the tech players. It gives zero dollars back. Um, barely, uh, I think the only thing it does is offer discounts for um, education um, institutions. All righty, so this is what I think about creating apps. Um, so to our discussion, here are lemmings jumping off of the cliff, creating apps, and then saying I'm having second thoughts on the way down. And this is why. 69% are removed, 70% basically, after 30 days. So that means I download it, and there's a 70% chance that someone's going to be like, I don't know this shit, delete it. 22% are used one time, then deleted. So only one in five basically are pretty much just one and done. They open it, and they're like, this is crap, and then don't use it. So if we're thinking about investing, the amount that we just discussed, the, the pros and cons between mobile web versus mobile app, we're like, huh, that's interesting. If you have to, um, if you have to create apps and you're in this meeting, um, I do recommend, um, yeah, I do recommend PhoneGap as a technology platform that allows you to create more or less one type of web app and allow that to be across multiple devices listed. Uh, but there are a lot of other ones. Donnie, are you familiar with PhoneGap? Yes. Yeah, and that's the one I recommend. Appcelerator, option one that costs a lot more. Any questions about native mobile apps? So a final thought here is actually a question. Who remembers this screen? Yeah. <laughs> what are we looking at? AOL. 
The AOL. Oh my, my god. Name, my aim name is like Peaches nineteen seventy two. Yo, can we go around really quick? What was your what was your aim name? Peaches Peaches one nine seven two. I still have the aim You're name, active but I'm still You're still playing. using this, aren't you? Yes, yeah, I'm not saying home. I have like five thousand in there but I never touch it. What was your aim? Greg without you. Greg without you? Yeah. With or without Greg. Yes. Oh, nice one. <laughs> really? No, you just won't share. No, I really. Let me guess. No Soccer girl two seven eight nine. I feel like that was ninety eight percent. Do you remember your aim name? Uh, <laughs> mine was Brooklyn Runs. What? Brooklyn Runs. I was a runner in Brooklyn. I was like, I'm very clever. So classy. <laughs> Damn it, I wish. Those are the good old days. So what happened to AOL? What the hell happened to AOL? What the hell happened to AOL? I still use it, though. This button right here. Do you remember this? Like, oh, I can finally find today's news and a newsstand and entertainment. So you had to have the disc to read the, to download it. If you, they were an internet service provider, and they had a gatekeeper. Oh, always, always free, always but the service free. costs you money. Yeah. yeah. I, f I feel like when I see an AOL email now, I'm like, what country are they from? Why do you use an AOL email? Yeah, I feel like that. Still has. Still, still does. Has still has. And he still in. uses this stupid application, and I hate that. But it's still <laughs> on the website. Dawn in Bonaire says her aim name was DMA ATK. Oh, she can hear us? You promised me, sir. <laughs> Okay. Oh, God. Oh. Donnie, you lied to me, you son of a... Listen, she's the one who lied. I didn't lie. What happened to AOL? What happened to AOL? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, it kind of blew your mind. All right. They thought of themselves as a one-stop shop. They had the internet service provider. We're going to provide you your internet and your entire experience on the web. We're going to offer you clubs and interests, computing, travel, marketplace, the kids only section, of course, for the gentlemen, sports. And don't pay any attention to the wizard in the corner, this tiny little button that says the internet connection, the rest of the goddamn web. And as we're thinking about this screen and what happens when you can't become the entire gatekeeper, you can't keep people in this room saying only pay attention to things in here. And by the way, there's one exit, but everyone stay in here and keep paying. How much does that relate to the other screen that we had before, where we had, how am I going to go back? How much does that relate to Epa? This screen. I think there's a lot of similarities between that AOL screen and this one. Pay no attention to this tiny little internet button. And so when you're thinking about should we build an app, should, how do we get onto phones, there's a lot of different ways. But I think the, the app mentality as we balloon well past 35 billion apps in this polluted market is like very interesting to think about. So I'm going to go back out, hopefully, and talk about what I think should be going on, which is the mobile web, the larger part of the iceberg when we're talking about mobile. So Facebook, bunch of numbers, ultimately 70% mobile, 30% desktop. 20% are mobile only. And in their world, here are the rough numbers for what's going on. 50% are accessing by app, 50% are accessing by mobile web. So of that giant mobile number, literally half of all of their activities actually happening through that mobile web experience. Here are two pictures. Can you figure out which one is which? If I were to hide that, <laughs> but that's the point. If I were to hide that, there's very little difference between the two. And by the way, this will disappear in a few seconds. I was able to snap the photo before it like disappeared my little URL. Hmm? Thanks, bro. Uh, uh, 
Um, I took it at different times, I think. Did I? <laughs> or did I see something? <laughs> so. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thanks, detective. I took it pretty damn close. Yeah, so this is the difference. They're constantly changing in any way, so if I, um, looks like I was still engaged to Megan Shackleton at this point. Oh, two minutes? Yikes. Yeah, but that's two like minutes. Got a new one. <laughs> you never changed your shirt. I did. That was a long time ago. Alrighty. So, huh? <laughs> I'm very, I'm very popular. Alrighty. The difference between these two, aside from these slight differences, is um, this one has to be supported across more than 35 different devices. They have got an army. When I say an army, I mean like literally like army of developers that is larger than the army of some small country. Definitely Costa Rica because technically they have no army. But this one costs a hell of a lot more to maintain across each device as opposed to this one. And so if you're working with a small budget and a company, you're like, how far can we push our mobile web experience that, by the way, is supported across these 35 plus and more devices with different operating systems on each? Because even though you're all holding up your iPhones, there are different versions of that operating system on there. And every time they update it, anyone who is maintaining an app will tell you, it's like, oh, shit. I now have to update all of my hooks into the accelerometer, the maps, the contacts, because they're changing things. It costs a lot. Other things about the mobile web. There's speed and then there's everything else. Um, on Amazon, they say that a 100 millisecond delay results in a 1% sales loss. Crazy. This is billions of dollars of company. Like they are losing millions of dollars for every single millisecond that the site loads slowly. On Yahoo, they show that a 400 millisecond delay results in a 5 to 9% drop in full page traffic. Means y'all are pretty impatient. 500 milliseconds, half second delay, drops search traffic by 20%. Half a second. One in five people are like, meh, I'm too busy. I'm too busy for this shit. <laughs> um, and AOL, for those that use it, <laughs> the fastest 10% users say that 50% longer than the, the slowest. So the faster users stay longer, twice as long. And right now, we're talking about a human attention span around seven seconds. But actually, on mobile, it's closer to three. If something doesn't load in three seconds, we're losing around 40% of the people, meaning like they think it's broken. And that sound, does that sound crazy to anybody? Uh, thank you, Dad. Um, let's have a quick conversation, though. Can you ask me for information about, I don't know, something? She's doing all right. Thanks for asking. Three lower than eight. Call one thousand. Three one thousand. Call one thousand. Five one thousand. Actually, we. Uh, <laughs> you won't even have a conversation with me at this point. If it takes that long to get a response from something, we're like, I mean, I already put this guy to sleep. He's nodded off. That was the most boring conversation he's ever been a part of. And that's what's happening even more so on mobile devices. When we go from a desktop experience, whatever you're looking at right now, you're like, all right, I'm a little impatient. I totally get it. Back in the AOL days, I used to wait 15 minutes to get online. On our mobile phones, <laughs> we're like, shit, it's broken. It's broken. And you used to lose and connection all the time. And someone would jump on and you'd just call and then it would just yeah. stop the whole thing. It's terrible. So when you walk into your next jobs and you walk in, there are people fighting over, oh, my gosh, the mobile website needs to be designed like this. It needs a picture of this. It needs a thing like that. You can walk in intelligently and say, how fast is it loading? Because it doesn't matter how pretty this or that is if no one freaking looks at it. Because if it takes longer than that like three and a half seconds to load, 40% of people are gone. It's crazy. We can use Google Analytics to look at this, by the way. Um, remember when I was showing you page speed before? And we can get an idea of that. When are we using mobile? This is a uh, use of 3G mobile uh, traffic patterns compared to laptop usage. So we have long, steady uses on laptop, right? We're on there for a while, we're opening emails, we're at work and we're doing things. So we're at work and then we go home. This is just monitoring how we're accessing our devices. Tablets, they're longer but more segmented sprints. Uh, I'm gonna go on here, do a few things, but I'm obviously on a tablet so I might be on the go, I might be on the couch, I might be watching TV, but I'm moving around a bit more throughout the day. And then smartphone, we have like you know, somebody who's got some sort of disorder who's just like manically on there, on average about 35 times. Oh, let me check, half sec. 
I mean, you guys are probably going to check your devices three to six times, literally, before I'm done in the next seven minutes. There you go. SMS, text messaging. Who here text messages? Everyone should raise their hand because everyone freaking text messages. Um, boasting over 91% open rate. 73% of adults with smartphones have SMS enabled. That's actually closer to 80% now. Um, an average of 40 texts per day is the median. Um, teens are sending uh, roughly 3,000, sending and receiving 3,000 texts every month. It's insane. This is the communication avenue that is doing the best right now. This is, if we're thinking about it, even better than 2,000 email. Remember in 2,000 email open rates are 50%. This is the email of 2000. SMS is one of the cleanest, I will say actually the cleanest channel to communicate with your potential audience. And so if you're trying to build a dedicated audience that you're trying to sell fashion items to, if you're trying to build a dedicated audience even at Globesville, instead of focusing potentially attention on an app market that has got billions that costs a lot, we can be thinking about how do we send a text message? Sure, you get only 160 characters, but at least people freaking open it and interact with it. Hmm? Rocket, Rocket chosen, chosen second. <laughs> what? Qwerty. Qwerty. Um, yeah. One thing about uh, text messages um, and opt-ins, we can have from a web opt-in, meaning somebody gives you your mobile address, or we can have uh, what is known as the keyword opt-in here, where we can text join, we can text a word to a short code, which just means a short phone number that you can register for, or have a shared short code. And texting this to this means that someone's going to get your information. You're going to get an automatic response to it. If you want to, is anyone not familiar with a keyword and short code? Standard text message or reply. Standard text message or reply. If you're not, you can text join to 38383 and be entered onto do something's text messaging blast list, and they are manic. Every week you'll get something. They have a high interaction, and there's a lot of uh, gamification on it. OK. I want to, yes, I want to show you this. So right now, um, this is a snapshot of one of my clients. And this is Facebook versus m.facebook. What is the difference between those two? Mobile. Yes, mobile. So Facebook's breaking up the mobile versus desktop traffic coming to it. Remember from our Google Analytics days, we can actually look at the total visits. So we have 13,000 versus 10,000, so quality versus quantity. We're getting a higher volume of Facebook.com to mobile.facebook. Why would this concern me? What is concerning about this? Which is higher, first off? No, I'm sorry. Facebook. Facebook. Which would you expect to be higher? Facebook. Why? What percent of people are currently on their phone on Facebook? And remember? 70 freaking percent. This should be a 70 30 split, right? So what is happening? What can we infer? They use the app and they stay on the app, right? This should be 70-30, arguably, if that is the makeup of the overall traffic between, remember, the ratio, if the ratio held. And right now it is definitely less. This is more like 40-60 in the other direction. Is everyone following this? If you're not, it's super important if you intend to make one single Facebook post in your future for a company and thinking about what is happening in the direction of the platform. It's literally your traffic, for this reason and some others, is being cannibalized by the fact that your experience on a mobile device on Facebook is very insular. You're staying on it and not coming over. And as Facebook goes from 70 to 75 to 80%, what is going to happen to this number? Small, exactly. Because people on mobile phones and that experience don't click through to your website. So this is kind of like canary in the coal mine type of thing to realize. But Facebook comes and goes, Twitter comes and goes, whatever comes and goes, you're going to be able to think about how your mobile traffic relates to any of these social platforms by looking at things like this. This is looking at, again, referring traffic from a platform, whatever the social media platform may be, to your website, and then saying, what is the performance? What are the performance differences? By the way, as we move down here into the quality, right? This is quantity. This is the quality. How good? 
Which one is better? Would you rather have somebody click to you from Facebook or the mobile Facebook? Why? Okay, they're staying longer. What other indicators? Pages per visit, right? Which is a proxy for quality. On average, 3.8 pages per single visit. What is the bounce rate? Just one page and then you leave. As if somebody walked into this room and then immediately walked out because I'm waving my arms around. And it's a pretty big difference, too. All righty. I'm going to skip by this. Women are going to take over the world. I can prove it. All right. So things to take away. Collect freaking mobile numbers. It is a pretty much clean channel to communicate to people. If you can possibly think of a strategy or a reason to create a texting interaction with you and your clients, if you're trying to sell a thing, if you're trying to deepen a, con a relationship, you can invest a heck of a lot less into text messaging than you'd have to into an app. Add value, talk to them, listen to them, get them. Um, WhatsApp becoming very huge and can become the disruptor and probably will to text messaging. So text messaging is not the silver bullet. I think what's going to happen, who here uses WhatsApp? Yeah. So right now it is probably like I think the largest as far as um, mobile messaging being sent to uh, between users, like one to one. BBM. Yeah. Um. <laughs> BBM. Well, that's weird though, because you can see when someone's like typing to you, yeah, you get this like dot dot dot. I don't like that. I do turn it off. Though. And you can that's see that's if it's do. using <laughs> time to like slash and write or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Or you just see um. the big Reddit hasn't been answered. Oh, that's me. I set an alarm for 10.30, just because. Um, Sandra, if you have to go, you can go. Alrighty. Yeah, I'm going to send a... You can set up a test shortcode at Textmarks. So if you want to play around with this thing, um, it's actually free-ish, super cheap. You can set up a short code text thing to 41411. So for example, since Donnie's not here, I might as well give him an example that he should have used. Um, on this, if I wanted to set a, say, text a thing to a thing, I could have said text dance to 41411. That would sign me up for alerts for what's going on with dance. And by the way, I could have said, if you sign up, I will give you the special super secret party and text you. And so that the next year when it came up, you could have a ready-made audience that you could reach and you actually know that they're probably going to get your text. Um, you could also get other information texted to them. So aside from just the permission to talk to them, I could also ask, what is your favorite dance move? I could do polling. I could do reasons to be engaged. I could sell sponsorship against that. And if I had, for example, Flavor Pill, I could probably upsell them. Would you like to, who here is familiar with Flavor Pill? Cool brand. They could be getting an upsell there uh, by selling an extra communication channel and opportunity to market for people. So he probably won't use that, but if he rewatches it, he will. Google Analytics, I have drilled into us again and again that we need to, to look at our data because we're able to look at things like do we get mobile traffic, yes or no, and what percent, and we can watch that change over time. Um, and then finally, learn about mobile first design. So when we're sitting in a design meeting and we need to redesign the website, you're going to hear this term, and this is what it means, mobile first. Mobile first means that we think about what is the device experience that we have when we're going through like this entire design process of here's our website, here are the different things that go everywhere. Instead of thinking about a giant screen, we're thinking about this screen first and designing for this. A little hamburger and like. Because that over time is going to be what people look at and then expand from there. And what's cool about mobile first design is that it's not about what you're trying to put in there, it's what you're taking out, and it focuses on what the core purpose, mission, communication goals of your organization are. This is the book if you're interested in reading it, and this is a, um, hmm? Good book. A book apart, great site for finding it. This guy is pretty much the champion of Luke Robuski. 
Uh, but if you want to be prepared for your next website redesign, that's the thing to do. All righty. I've got any questions. So overall, um, you guys are very smart. You're right. Um, no, we should not build an app here unless it's completely free and we get learning objectives out of it because nobody will download it. The people that download it, only one in five are going to stick around. The rest will only open up once and then throw it away. Um, and by the way, you'd have to figure out, is it mobile for Android or for iPhone? We can use something like Accelerator. We can use something like PhoneGap to make sure that we build like one code base and it kind of goes out. But ultimately, what it's doing is just repackaging what Glowzill does and then spitting it into a mobile app when we already have a mobile web device. Now, if Globesville were something completely different, it were like actually about trotting around the world and checking in and leaving, you know, stories and images on a locative map and like you needed an uploading feature that was right on your phone that you could do it and save it for later, something crazy like that that could only be done because you're using the mobile hooks of GPS, of the camera feature, of your contacts. Then you can begin to convince me that it's worth it, but that better be your freaking business plan because you need an army of developers. You need to be really uh, on top of the fact that that app is being built right now for an operating system that hasn't been invented yet or hasn't been updated yet. And you're like, ah, crap, this becomes our business. And I think a lot of people jump into bed with apps without realizing the long-term commitment. Huh? <laughs> yeah, the Google Minute app. Finally, a way for people to, to submit Google Minutes. <laughs> That's the spirit. All right, I want to talk about I want to talk about conformity, consistency, and how we influence people. This is both for online, but this is also offline as well. This is uh, an example. Households were asked to predict what they would do if asked to volunteer for three hours to collect for charity. When asked later, how much more did this group conform than a group that was not asked at all? So again, that side of the table, you're asked, would you be willing? Not, you don't even have to do it. Someone calls you up, would you be willing to volunteer for three hours for a charity? Are you the type of person that would volunteer three hours for charity? No. Like These are kids with like diseases that are so sad, it'll make you cry. You guys, nothing. Nobody asked you shit, except for when asked later, we're going to ask you to, would you go out there and collect for charity? Would you go out there on the street you know, and ring the bell Salvation Army style? All right, so this is the difference between this side and this side. The question is, how much more likely do you think that the group this side donated that said, that said yes to collect for charity? And I'll give you some options. So we'll say 50% um, more. We'll say 100% more. We'll say 200, 300. Um, I don't know, 500. So let's get some votes. What do you think? And everyone understands what I'm talking about. We're talking about how, and this could be if I was trying to get you to do whatever it is, buy ballet tickets, if it were to like sign up for a shopping thing, if it were to whatever it may be. In this case, I chose charity because that's my thing. What do you think? Raise a hand. What do you think? Where did you vote? 70%, so I'll put you in camp 100%, sure. 200. 200. 100. You can put you down for two, oof, big spender. Where are you going? Going 100. 100. All right, so 200s, why do you think it's, why do you think it's so high? Why do you think it's so high? I mean, sorry, I could also have zero here. No one said, z no one wanted to argue zero. It's the same damn thing. Anyone want to change their thing to zero? Same damn thing? Donna, you have to say which one you believe. Households, half the room was previously asked, would you be willing to volunteer three hours? The other half of the room was not asked that prior. And then they were all called saying, hey, would you go out there and ring the bell for Salvation Army? Would you go there and collect for charity? What is the likelihood that you're more likely to conform to that request. I'm sorry, you're saying there's a difference between just saying just going to charity and listening to 
program? No, no, no. One, like one is a two-step program, okay. and one is just the one-step program. These guys had two. They all only do the one-step program. These guys get the one-step. Everyone gets the final, will you collect for charity? Okay. But this half the room, mm -hmm. prior to that ask, was requested, would you be willing to volunteer for three hours for a charity? You don't have to do it. We're just wondering if you are the type of people that do that. Okay. What is the difference? How much more likely is this side? Anybody else who said 200? Why was it? So you're like, so you're talking about self-identity, right? Once you've identified yourself and labeled your ins inside yourself, by the way, you're all pretty malleable. You're the type of people that will be swayed by whatever you're saying that you are. If I'm a music person, if I'm an athlete, this is the type of thing I do. I do things like go to the gym. If I think of myself as a gamer, I'm the type of person that is going to go out and pay attention to the new gaming thing. If I'm the person who has been previously identified by myself, I'm the type of person, yeah, I'm the type of person who volunteers and types of that. So I like that argument, and that's one of the conformity components. Donnie, where are you? You have to vote. I still honestly don't an have, you don't understand the question. I have no idea what you're really asking. Can you help explain it to Donnie? I also have it written in English, too, here. How much did they say yes to that request? How much? How do you quantify a yes? It's not how much. It's like we have two groups. How, what's the percentage difference? What's the percentage difference between a group that was asked this first question versus not? How many more people do you think volunteered? If they were asked for it or not. Oh, meaning that they, they did it because they wanted to? Yeah, it doesn't matter. No, no, no. They were later. Why? Someday, Donnie, you'll catch up. Seven hundred percent. Seven hundred percent. Seven X. So down here, I definitely tricked you with the spread, but that's freaking crazy. And actually, what you were talking about—that conformity, that self-identity—exactly is what's going on. I suddenly, after that meaningless conversation, otherwise to me, because I've identified myself as somebody who cares about charity, but this could have been anything. By the way, I, do you are you someone about caring with the like most recent fashion trends? Yes, I am. Great, great talking with you guys. See you in a week. Seven X likely to buy my goddamn thing the next time to do the thing I'd like to do. So what does this translate into as a strategy? Is if you want someone to do an action, think about what is the setup you could do before that. How do you play with conformity? And this can happen online. For example, there's an app called Charity Miles. One of the things that they do, Charity Miles, super cool app. It tracks how far you run and then donates however far you ran or walked. Uh, translates that into miles and gives to a charity of your choice. At the end of that experience, it says, would you like to thank the person who's donating? Sure. I'd like to thank the person who's donating. The next ask is, great, share this on Twitter. That gets a 50% conversion rate as opposed to literally down in the under 10% range. So this is if you want to share, if you want to sell a thing, we can design for experience around conformity and consistency. Heady topic. I'm going to skip this because Donnie's in the room and he gets confused. <laughs> All right. Influence. Robert Charlene. This is the book. This is basically the grandfather of any sales book that you're ever going to read. And a lot of these original topics that he talks about can be replicated. Right? We're playing with social proof right now. We have an experiment. Remember social proof? The more people that freaking like this thing, the more I'm going to turn off my brain and say, other people like it, so do I. Um, all of these things can be played with online. All righty. I want to move into how any one of you can, in your next organization, company, whatever it may be, use what you've been learning at Gillesville this semester. And what we've been doing this semester is content marketing, a.k.a. hustling. The elements of content marketing is just create great stuff, put it where people look for it, <laughs> and regularly and frequently be helpful. 
just be helpful to people online by giving away free information. And what you're building is your authority, your reputation around a topic. And this is what Globetrotter has been doing, except we just don't have a selling point. We're building our authority as the go-to source for music, for sports, for whatever you're trying to find about the NYIT community. Now let's say we're going to come in and sell a product that would make sense. We have a built-in audience. Literally, there are thousands of minutes watched per week of our content. We've got online content that is hopefully growing. And so at a certain point, we could turn that reputation, that content marketing, into whatever that sale may be. So this is um, just to give you insight into uh, how I'm treating my company. Here are my strategy for creating website articles over time and the slow growth up to about, now I get about, I don't know, a thousand folks per month as opposed to where I started, which was obviously like hundreds, you know, like 150 per month, uh, basically myself and my mom. <laughs> and you can look, remember these different numbers, sessions and users, these are visitors and unique visitors. Google changed this. Two weeks ago, they changed this, so this is just a quick note and follow-up that it's now called Sessions and Users. Sessions, remember what visitors were? Okay, yeah. Sessions are now visitors. Oh. Right? So Sessions is now the number that they use across the board to talk about visitors. And then this is Unique Visitors. This is that number. Users are the unique users, visitors. Oh, okay. Right? These are individual people that came during the time, and, and these, are the, are these are the, these are like the amount of interactions. Okay, cool. Right? You all in this class are, you know, each one of you representing one unique visitor, basically one user to this class, but you would have multiple sessions, some of you more than others because you actually show up to class. Yes, I'm looking at you. So sessions, the amount of times you came to class, you, you're the user. And Google's trying to make this a lot simpler and focus on that. So when you go in there and you see all these damn things changed, I, that's the thing. One of the strategies that I use when I create an article or when I'm interviewing somebody, I'm trying to make them the hero. In here, I'm writing an article about Optimizely, among other things. So I have five great web optimization services besides Google Analytics, something that my audience is going to find valuable. There's some great stuff in here, one of which is using Optimizely. Yeah, some are free, some are pretty cheap. But this is an interesting article, and I'm giving just sharing the love and I'm saying these guys are awesome these guys are awesome and then I'll actually go ahead and tweet that including at Optimizely who's got a significant following and they then retweet it and what happens what happens when I do that people that follow Optimizely see me what happens after that and what else may they do might they do might interact with me, might go to my website, might become somebody that gives me their email because the sole purpose of my site is to inform and grab your freaking email. And then what happens after that? Then hopefully they become a loyal customer. Then hopefully they become a loyal customer of whatever I happen to be selling, which is nonprofit technology information. I'm giving a shitload away for free, and I happen to know that 0.5% of everyone I gain might become a really great client, and that's a win for me. And in the meantime, I give away a lot of free content. This is content marketing. This is a fundamental part of content marketing. Greg, you could be doing this for gaming. This is an easy thing to do. You could be doing this for fashion, certainly. Whatever the topic is, content marketing is probably the most effective way right now to become heard and build in your own audience. Any questions on this? Gesundheit. I jinxed it. Yeah. Disaster averted. All right. <laughs> right now, I have another experiment going on. I'm playing with podcasting. I like podcasting right now as a, another way of content marketing because it is an uncluttered channel with regard to at least when somebody downloads your podcast and they're listening to it, you have literally one of their senses locked. They're listening to you. So at least, though other things may be distracting them, you have got a clean channel, kind of like SMS. But this is uh, so far in our first month. Actually, this was early on. Our first month, we've had over 10,000 downloads around the, the podcast I've been putting out there. Hopefully, that'll be able to grow. But I'm doing the same thing. I'm using it as an excuse to talk to people. If you created a podcast, you could talk to experts in the field, and suddenly they'll accept your call for an interview as opposed to a sales call. I talked about advertising, but I'm going to ignore advertising for now. Any questions on content marketing? Hopefully... 
dawns on you that that is exactly what we've been doing. Except we don't sell anything. Okay. You know, I think for the sake of that, I'm just going to go through a couple of these. Feedback loops. So who has ever seen a speed limit sign like this? I've talked about this before, right? What does the speed limit sign do? Tells you how fast you're going and how fast you should be going. This is 30% more effective in getting you to slow down over time because it's telling you in that same spot, you should be going this fast, this is how fast you are going. One, you're being monitored, right? There's this like sort of like big brother, I'm being observed. And remember observed behavior? You're more likely to grade favorably, you're more likely to respond in a way that will please the person asking you. For example, when you went to the doctor and they asked you, hey, how many drinks do you normally have per week? Did you tell them the truth? No, I don't. Cut it in half. Yeah, that's a gentleman's, <laughs> gentlemen's and ladies, cut in half. Everybody knows that. The doctors know that. It's a 2x, classic. So that's an observed behavior. When we can see this observed behavior, there's a social norm. There's this like, oh my gosh, things are being watched all the time. You can use this to influence organizational behavior. And what do I mean? Well, just from an analytics standpoint, you can create dashboards. You can set weekly reports to go to yourself, to team members, and say, hey, we're all responsible for more users or more traffic from social networks. And if they know that every week everybody in the team gets this, they're like, oh, crap, I have to maintain and manage things. So if you want to become super manager and you want your team to pay attention to your authority and respect your authority, you want to set up feedback loops so that they know that you know that they know that you're watching and you expect these numbers to happen. You don't even need to open that freaking email. You just need to make sure that everyone at the table gets that same report every single week and that they know that you're watching these numbers and you care about them. And suddenly they're going to pay attention to you. Right now I'm running an experiment to try to get my office to recycle more. And I've created a feedback loop there where I literally count the number of shit in the trash that people put, like recycling items in the trash. I count it and I let them know every single week how many they have screwed up on. And I just put it out there. And so far the number's starting to go down because people are like, oh shit. Because I also in that report report whether or not it was Chipotle or Thai food or whatever it was. <laughs> so I'm a bit manic. Let's just put that out there. But I am going to influence a goddamn behavior change if it kills me. And I'm doing it through a feedback loop. I'm simply holding up a mirror and saying, this is what you guys are doing. And that's it. And so if you're talking about influencing behavior and leading from behind, feedback loops are your friend. OK, ask what do the data say? Hopefully you walk out of this class with this in your head. What do the data say is the most important question, especially as big data becomes available on every single thing you do and can inform it. If you're not familiar with this, the hippo, the highest paid person in the organization. You're going to run into the hippo. The hippo may want to tend to lead with their gut. Trust me, I know I'm right. I've got the experience to do it. And um, in my mind, data trumps gut. Gut can inform the direction. We should put a man on the moon within the decade type of thing. That's great. That's vision. My gut says this is the right thing for the country. That's fine. You have to have that level of trust. But data will get you there. Data will tell you whether or not you're going east instead of north. As you use data, don't be this guy. As you can see, he went in and said, ha, you're wrong, I'm right, the data says so, and got fired or chased down the street by the hippo. Don't do that. It's a great thing. So conceptually, bring an empty chair to a meeting, to your organization, to wherever you're going, and say, look, let's put data in the chair. Say, what do the data say? It is not me telling you. This is information unbiased as much as possible that we're trying to communicate. Da, 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 da. All right. Dealing with fears is important with regard to, hey, what's up? Yeah, he's pretty sleepy today. You're going to have to wake him up. All right. So dealing with fears, people are going to be, without a doubt, fearful of using data. I'll wait till Andre leaves. Get some rest, big guy. Um, there's a great book, Switch. And this is a final point about moving sort of information or insights we might find. So we found certain insights like don't build a goddamn app today. We figured out, oh my gosh, mobile versus mobile web versus mobile app. 
we figured out like, oh, what's going on? But all of that information as you walk into a place, if you can't convince somebody, a team, an executive, whoever, that this is the right way to go, uh, is pretty pointless. So this book, another good book, Switch by Dan and Chip Heath, is about how we influence change behavior. And in here, this is a drawing that I recreated from the book. Um, no big deal, yeah, pretty good artist. You're doing that computer. Work. This, yeah, I definitely drew this. Um, <laughs> it took a lot of time to draw it, I think. That's not true. Rider and the elephant. This explains every single person, including Andre, in the world. Um, here, Andre's brain, his logic center. This is what determines, most of the time, logically what he's doing. The elephant is the emotional center. This is the thing that is actually in charge in this relationship. So we've got our brain and we've got our heart. And this is, for example, if you've ever been on a diet and you've passed by donuts once, donuts twice, on the third time, you're getting worn down. And eventually, once you get tired at the end of the day, oh, I totally deserve this. Logically, I don't care if it's going to make me fat or unhealthy. I want what I want when I want it. And this is this ongoing sort of battle between the two. My head knows that I should be doing something like working out every single day. And my elephant says, oh my gosh, I'm tired. I just want to play with my iPad. Now, how we use this in turning data into action happens when we need to convince somebody. Logically, we may find the answer. We may find the answer that, holy shit, let's not build this stupid app. Well, that is only an insight in your head. We have to emotionally charge this and say, how do we influence the, the elephant? In this book, one of the better examples is that he, um, he talks about this moving company. The moving company is um, trying to reduce the costs of these gloves. And all these construction guys wear these gloves. And he realizes that there's like literally like there's a glove in Seattle that's like five bucks and a glove in New York that's like 30 bucks. And he's like, this is absurd. We have to standardize this. And everyone's like, ah, it's too hard. We won't be able to do it. Goes around, gets gloves from every single regional place with the price tags on, dumps it on the desk in front of everybody. Dumps it on the desk in the boardroom, and everyone is able to pick it up, look at these tags, and say, oh, what the hell? There's a $30 difference. This is the same glove. They get angry. They fire up this sort of elephant. And then the path, the director, he says, all we have to do, go with the supplier and make this change. And suddenly, by tying together these things, by making it real, by also presenting an emotional argument that taps into that idea of that we're also being driven by an elephant, he was able to change the organizational behavior in there. And so getting back to our mobile app example, so the mobile app versus mobile web, we can be making arguments like, yes, 30% of our current traffic is actually on mobile. But an app is going to get into such and such and such and such. Well, if we were to focus on our mobile web first, let me tell you about Jessica. Jessica currently is an NYIT student, and she tried to pull up our site. She was going to take the class, couldn't find that information, Professor Fizz. She couldn't find the information on the mobile web site because it loaded too slowly. Um, the mobile app wouldn't have even been downloaded in this case. Jessica's not going to take the class. Class is over. <laughs> we could suddenly get his attention by saying, oh, crap, I get the prioritization because I have this store that makes it real. I'll leave it there with this, uh, this idea. Hopefully, you can uh, chase this down. But the, the sort of data into action is the final piece. Our next class, um, hopefully, you'll be here. But we've got a take-home final that I'll be emailing out to everyone. You can do it at home. Um, hopefully, you do it at home and bring that to class or email it to uh, email it to myself. Yes. yes. What were you pointing at me? Yeah, email to me. Email to me. So I'll send that out. And hey, next class we'll be doing a brief lecture, and then um, I think we'll do the final. Yeah, we'll do final meeting. Sound right, Donnie? Sounds about right. Cool. Thanks, folks.